Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Katie and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank this committee for, um, wow, incredible event, incredible conference. Um, I just, really quick, just good job to the committee for all its work. Amazing. These are these are huge uh, to put together. And thank you so much, Mike, for um, getting up this morning and sharing all that history. I feel so connected to this conference. It's my first time here. That was so beautiful to hear all of that. And um, I met someone in the back, like this, is like your thirtieth time being here. Uh, unbelievable. I, I just I can sense the love in this room, the um, the love of Alcoholics Anonymous, the enthusiasm for this program of recovery, and um, you're my kind of people if you're enthusiastic about Alcoholics Anonymous. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I love it. I yes, that that deserves a clap. Hey hey. <laughs> Um, and before I get into my enthusiasm for Alcoholics Anonymous, thanks to all the people who are taping in the back. Um, and thank you very much. Um, speaker tapes, especially when I was new, were just like, they were, um, yeah, unbelievable to hear and to hear these great, these great uh, communicators in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not one of them, so sorry. Um, we do have an elite lineup in the front row, minus Jimmy. I'm not sure. We'll see tonight. Um, <laughs> they're they're going to be heckling me the whole time. So if you see me doing look, looks, it's because of these guys in the front. Um, but I, I I am super super grateful to be here. And then a uh, couple things you need to know about me, real quick is uh, I have a sobriety date, I have a sponsor, and I have a home group. So my sobriety date is January 17, 2006. That means I woke up this morning with 6,297 days of continuous sobriety, free from the desire to drink and self-destruct. And that is a result of uh, an incredibly loving God and um, the principles that are outlined in our in our program. I'm forever, forever grateful. I, um, I did... Uh, uh, not come to. I, I woke up on purpose this morning, and that's certainly not how I used to live my life. I I, I came to to a, to a baby crying who also had me up from midnight to three a.m. going up, down, up, down. So um, I'm well caffeinated, if you can't tell. Um, I drink for effect, always have, and continue to. Um, <laughs> caffeine is the real winner this weekend, and. Um, yeah, so I so that sobriety date, I, I try to do everything I can to keep it, um, and I treat I, Alcoholics Anonymous is serious in my life. I, I had a friend who told me that uh, Katie, you should work a, a hard program so you get an easy life. I don't know if it's easy, but it's definitely simpler than the life I was living before. Um, and I have a sponsor who knows that she's my sponsor. Her name is Tamara B, and I feel like she always knows what I'm doing in, in AA. So I got to walk around and say hi to a lot of people because my sponsor told me to suit up and show up in AA and um, be the hand of AA and to, to, to look people in the eye and shake hands. We'll talk about looking people in the eye because I get to be free today. We'll talk about that later. Um, but I have a I have a hand in a sponsor and a sponsor's hand, and I have a hand in sponsee's hands. And I don't have a hand left to pick up a drink, so I feel very safe and protected in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous um, <laughs> with hands like that. And then I have a home group. It's uh, Folsom Big Book Group in Folsom, California. Yes, where the prison is. Um, and uh, we, yeah, we're a big book study, and we we read this big book, and I love hearing. 60, 70, 80 people turn the pages of the big book every week. Um, it's, it's just exactly where I need to be, and it's a good home group. So if you're if you're in town on a Monday night, 410 Wool Street, I'll be there. But that is my AA address, and unless I'm out of town or in the hospital, um, uh, that's where I'm going to be. Okay, all that said, I did drink alcohol. I'm a drunk. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I am uh, a vodka drinker. Um, I am a warm vodka drinker. I am a... Plastic bottle, red cap, pop off drinker. Um, there, yes, girl. Yes, um, I love the people that come up to me because, like, you get it. You know. Okay, I did not want or like to drink warm vodka. I had to drink warm vodka because my vodka is underneath the seat of my car. It's in my underwear drawer. I live in Sacramento, so it's hot there. Sometimes it's hot vodka, like good, 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 like, oh, um, it's extra burny. And um, <laughs> um, vodka is like, it, it's, it's, it's a solution. It is a solution for how I feel. Um, and I found that magic when I was 13 years old. I, I waited way too long. Um, I had my first drink and I was like, I could have really used this in kindergarten, man. Like, um, 
I, I'm so I'm sweaty. Um, I'm just sweaty. I'm really awkward. I never know what to do with my hands. I was like this really skinny, scrawny. Just I felt I just felt so uncomfortable all the time. And I'm like at a new school with a new friend, Dana. And you can picture Dana. So I'm like skinny, scrawny. I'm sweating down to my waist, and she's like beautiful. She's like Barbie. She's so tall. Um, she looks like she's 20 in my mind and, um, she's just, she can talk to boys and I don't know what to do with my hands and I'm uh, hanging out with her and, um, she hands me a red solo cup and I found the solution to my life in that red solo cup. Um, I don't know what was in it, but I, I knew what to do (laughs) and I felt the, the burn down my throat and I felt it hit my gut and, um, (sighs) that happened, you know. And I just didn't even realize I'd been holding my breath. Um, I didn't know how tight my skin was until it had loosened up. And uh, I was like, I'll have more of that, please. And um, and I don't I, I don't know how to describe this. Uh, it's really weird. I had like this, I, well, I had a lot of phobias. I had a ton of fears, but I had this really big fear of like, it's so inappropriate to talk about, but I'm going to like mention it lightly. Like bathroom stuff, like the bathroom, like admitting that I went, this is so embarrassing, um, that I like went to the bathroom, but like I, I drank and um, we told these like jokes and she was laughing with me. Like we were laughing together and I felt free. I know that's like such a weird thing, but like for this 13 year old girl who had was so afraid of like all these weird things, I was like laughing and joking with this girl who I admired and I felt free. And, um, I want, and I wanted that. (laughs) And, um, I wanted that. I wanted more. And, um, and that first night, like nothing crazy happened, you know, I, um, I drank and I drank and I drank and I got really, really sick and I was like, let's do it again. Um, let's go. And, um, so I'm a, I'm a teenage alcoholic. So, um, and so my stories are just sad. Um, I don't know (laughs) how else to say them. Um, alcoholic women in the room, we're just, we have, if you're like me, you have sad stories. Um, Uh, I have a lot of stories of of the beginning of the night, and then all the, you know, the the end of my stories are what have been repeated to me. So um, I'm a blackout drinker. I blacked out pretty much every single time that I drank. Um, The only thing that ever really changed in my stories was the shoes and the guy. Um, It always pretty much looked the same. And, um, And it started like that for me almost like right away. Um, people talk about lines they crossed. I don't know about lines. I just know that when I started drinking, I couldn't stop. I had no control. And that, and and I know I I can, I can pinpoint when I was, I was fifth, I'm pretty sure I was 15 years old and I'd gone to a party and I, I I did not plan to have alcohol poisoning. (laughs) Um, I thought that I changed my mind when I started drinking and I was going to go to this party to have a good time and I started drinking the vodka and, um, and then I drank the whole bottle and, um, uh, I was rushed to the emergency room and my parents were told I may not make it through the night. Um, you know, social worker looks at this 15 year old girl and how much alcohol she consumed and, um, decided I was definitely trying to commit suicide. Um, I w- didn't have the language to say, like, I, I just overshot the mark. Um, actually I was like pretty out. And so, um, I was 51 50 and taken away from my parents. And, um, what I, what I remember like yesterday, and this is the gift of getting to, um, to share my story that, that says in, uh, how it works. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. And that's how I get to do that is I get to remember, uh, my mom, my dad, and my little brother walking into, um, a, you know, a psych hospital, me having been in the hospital for a couple of days and now in the psych hospital with the locks on the other side of the door. And, um, uh, my dad who I'd never seen cry, um, holds me in his arms and is wailing aloud. And I still vomited my hair from four days before. And he's asking aloud to God or to, who, I don't know who, um, what have I done wrong? And at 15, I, I, I wanted to be a good kid. Like, I loved my daddy. You know, I loved him so much. And I wanted to be a good kid. And I wanted to do the right thing. And um, I swore up and down that I was never going to drink again that day. Laying in that psych ward hospital bed uh, with throw up still in my hair and my dad wailing aloud. Um, I meant it. If you had given me a lie detector test that day, I would have passed it. I was never going to drink again. And I was drunk the next weekend. Uh, so I know for sure that by the time I was 15, I, um, I'd lost the ability to control my drinking. Um, you know, it was, there was, a, the, the thought always was, you might have been a little hasty. 
you know, with that decision about never drinking again. Well, maybe you could, maybe it's, maybe it's the vodka. Like maybe if you tried beer and then 16 beers later, um, and, and, and so, you know, I'm really grateful when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous that it was pointed out to me in the book and more about alcoholism. It talks about young people and, and women very specifically that were often gone beyond recall in a few short years because I found my way into Alcoholics Anonymous for the first time when I was 19. And, um, and, uh, and I actually, my first meeting, I was told you're, you're, you're too young to be here. And, um, all, all the things that were said, I was not like, oh, we'll love you too. You love yourself. I mean, I had to like earn my seat for some reason at my first meeting, but, um, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I'm, uh, I'm 19 years old and I'm drinking alone. Um, I, I, uh, was wanted, like I said, I wanted to be a good kid. I was a really good student. And so I, I, I went to college and, um, you know, a, a Tuesday night for me was, um, cause I'm, cause I'm I, not only am I a blackout drinker, I'm a, I like to drink and drive. I think, you know, I'm a really good driver when I'm drunk. I've had thousands of DUIs, never gotten caught. And, um, I, uh, I, so I, but I'm getting a little scared cause I'm like coming to, and people are saying, you just, that's the third red, red light you ran. And, um, it scared me a little bit. So Tuesday night would have been, you know, me with my with my pint of of uh, pop off and um, some herbal refreshments and a four pack pepperoni pizza hot pocket and a Disney movie and a pen and pad and paper and I'm like writing what this movie's really about. You know what I mean? I got like I got like a dissertation on Alice in Wonderland somewhere and um, just alone, you know. And that just that just seemed fine fine to me because no one really wanted to hang out with me much much anymore. Um, I remember a friend saying, I've, I've never been more terrified of someone when they start drinking than you, and I've never had to fight someone to take alcohol away from you. And um, so just people didn't want to hang around me. And, uh, and what happened for me is um, kind of miraculous. I don't know. I don't know how else, to, how else to put it. It's amazing how like all of the miracles in Alcoholics Anonymous are always in the rearview mirror. They're never like, I never recognize the miracle, <laughs> rarely recognize the miracle right here. It's always it's always back there, and um, I, I have to tell you, I was an atheist, so I'm 19. Uh, you, you can picture me in college, sitting alone in my room, drinking drinking pop-off, and I'm an atheist, and I'm so mad at God, this God that doesn't exist, and um, I feel really bad for all you people of faith and how dumb you are, because I'm pretty much the smartest person that's ever existed in the world, and if only everyone thought and believed as I did, then the world would be pretty great. Really, truly believed that, and... Um, uh, and yet, <laughs> I look back and I see how God has his fingerprints ev- all over every single thing that I'm about to tell you. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I was a nanny, um, those poor people, and um, <laughs> they, take me to, they take me to St. Croix for a month. They have this beautiful estate, and um, I'm watching their nine-month-old and their three-year-old, and I, am, um, I don't remember the trip at all. Um, because the drinking age was 18 and I was 19, so already on. And um, I, uh, the last day there, I, I went out and um, I, I remember just I was drinking my 16th. I, I counted my beers for some reason when I was drinking beer. They like, counted. I know it was on my 16th. It was a Corona. They put grenadine in it, and the bartenders were making me like wait till the lime hit the top of the. I don't know. That's all I remember is that last thing that happened. And then um, I came to the next day and um, I was supposed to start nannying at 7 a.m. It was three in the afternoon. I'm definitely not in the house where I'm supposed to be. There's a baby on the floor. It's not my baby. And um, there's like birds everywhere. And um, <laughs> it's bizarre. And I, you know, and again, alcoholic women, we wake up in lots of varied states. Yeah. I was, this was not an unusual state for me to white wake up in. Um, I'm always, who, who's around me? <laughs> What's happening? And, um, but I, I, I get myself, uh, ready to go and I'm taken back to where I'm supposed to be nanny and I walk in the house at three in the afternoon. They have no idea where I've been. And the little girl, this little three year old girl who I just, I loved her so much. She was the sweetest thing. She looks at me in horror and says, mommy, what's wrong with Katie? And, um, I, I caught a glimpse of myself for the first time in the, in the, in a mirror and I'm just, I'm black and blue. And, um, I, like I said, I'd woken up in varied states, but there was something about that that was, um, a little extra scary because then the, what's amazing is the next day I'm on a flight home and my parents are holding an intervention. And if that had happened two days, three days, four, a week later, I would have had a rationalization, a justification, something, you know, that I could have given you to say that it wasn't that bad. Um, 
but I was just broken that much, and I hear a lot of people up here talk about seconds and inches, and that was that was that moment for me. And I and I couldn't have told you at that moment that alcohol was even the problem in my life. I absolutely could not have told you that. But my parents had um, had found they they had laid on the table all my empty bottles that I had hid all over all my pop off all over my room, and. Um, uh, you know, had had excuses for all of it, but they said we. You know, we're, my parents are not Alanons. Oh my gosh, they could teach Alanon. I don't know. They are like black belts and something. And they're they're. I mean, I'm I'm ready to go. They were so done with me and and how I'd been living my life. And they said we need you to go talk to someone. I didn't. I was getting bamboozled. I didn't even know it. But I went to an intake at a treatment facility, and you know they're asking all the questions on the intake. That's the questionnaire. It's yes and no stuff, right? And um and I'm giving essay answers. You know, did you drink in the morning? What do you consider morning? That's a, that's a pretty big. That's there's a big window there, you know. And um and this this gentleman um after after going through my 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 drinking career only in AA do we have careers um. Uh, <laughs> He puts down this pad of paper and um, he looks at me and he starts talking about alcoholism. And I'd never heard anything like this. And um, he he said the words restless, irritable, and discontented. And I had I'd never heard three words that more fit how I felt. And th this man was like so old, sorry, but I was 19 and he was like 60 or something. And it was like I'm re I, I didn't relate to people my own age, right? And I am relating to this man. It was the most remarkable thing getting to start to identify with someone because I just, I felt so different than everybody. And, um, and he told me that I probably wasn't going to make it to 25. And, um, and I heard him. And I had like this little bitty tiny moment of clarity. And a moment of clarity has been described to me as where God paralyzes the liar in me long enough for me to hear the truth. And I heard a little bit of it, just, just a touch. And what was amazing about that truth that I heard is that I didn't want to die. Because I'd been suicidal since I was 10 years old. I think I found alcohol just in the nick of time. Alcohol kept me alive long enough for me to find you in Alcoholics Anonymous and save my life. And so I didn't want to die. I don't know where that came from either. And he said, give me 30 days, I can change your life. And that's a pitch. <laughs> it's a pitch. And I said, okay, I'd never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't, I didn't know anything, but I start going to this treatment. And, and then I'm pissed because um, I'm identifying as an alcoholic, and then you're telling me that um, I have to have entire abstinence to alcohol. Like, you're joking. I thought you were really, I thought I'd been doing it wrong. Like, I, I kept trying all these different combinations. Like, I thought maybe if I had some really good therapy, I was going to be able to, like, drink like my friends drink. Like they, like, they all have, like, a Mike's Hard Lemonade. Like, I'm drinking warm vodka. Like, maybe I can move, move into that spectrum. And then I'm ah, finding out that I, I no, I, I actually have to not take a drink a day at a time for potentially the rest of my life. And I was really angry about that. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you grieved alcohol, but I sure did. Um, all, all, all the stages of grief. And um, I am so mad. And then I see God on the wall, and that really pissed me off. And someone handed me a big book. It was um, it must have been an H&I meeting. And someone handed me a book, and I didn't have a sponsor. Never been to a meeting, and um, I I opened the I opened this book, and I'm like, war fever ran high. I don't know, and I'm like flipping through the pages, and um, and I see this chapter called We Agnostics, and I'm like, cool, start there, and um, <laughs> chapter four, and um, I'm uh, I, I oh my gosh, I remember it like yesterday. I'm like smoking 500 cigarettes at one time in my parents' backyard, and I'm underlining every single line in that chapter. Um, we miss the reality and the beauty of the forest because we're diverted by the ugliness of some of its trees. And I had this moment that maybe I'm wrong. Um, maybe. Um, <laughs> I could be wrong about something um, just for a minute. And I don't know. Like, I don't know much about anything. But sometimes I, I really believe that a spiritual experience starts with me believing that maybe I could be wrong about something. And um, and that night at like six days sober, I um, I didn't get on my knees. I didn't say God. I just said the little this little alcoholic prayer, and which was help me. And um, I was washed over from the top of my head to my toes with um, a warmth, a love, a peace, a serenity that was better than the first drink. It, it had to have been. It ha God had to come in that way. Because I'm an effects-driven person, I like to feel different, and I felt different. And I had this small, small voice say within me that 
your alcoholism is not a curse, it's a gift, it's a relationship with me, and boy, has that proved to be true. And I would like to tell you that I stayed sober from then. I did not. Um, I did not. So um, if you're new, I am not any type of authority on Alcoholics Anonymous, on spiritual experiences, on the steps. I am, I am just sharing my experience. That is it. Um, but what I believe I had was a first contact with God. I was so far, and, and God came very quick. But didn't, it did not spell a spiritual awakening. That was not it for me. A spiritual experience is described very well in our book, um, as specifically in Appendix 2 in the back. It talks about a complete transformation in thought and attitude, an, an upheaval. <laughs> Here's me. I'm different. I, that did not happen. Me, me asking God for help, I, I was absolutely the same person. Um, I had just not been drinking alcohol. Um, in fact, I, so much so, um, when I was six months sober, my mom told me she preferred me drunk because at least I was nice to her. Because me without booze, I'm like the best way I can describe, I'm a, I'm a walking nerve. Like everything, like someone's peeled off my skin with a potato skin peeler and I'm walking through a salt fog. Like it is painful. Like it hurts. It hurts to exist without a spiritual solution and without alcohol. And I, I you know, I, I showed up to everything in life as a taker. I showed up to my first meeting late. I left early. I didn't, I didn't bother to, to figure out that there was like commitments and jobs and no, everything is just always here waiting for me to like show up to grace you with my presence, you know? And, um, I, I, it's so funny. So many, well, how do you know if you've had a spiritual experience? I'm like, like probably not asking, but I don't know. Um, but I had an old timer tell me once, um, the difference between, you know, someone who's gone through a spiritual experience is the person who walks in the door and is like, Hey, here I am, everybody. Here I am. Versus the person that's had this contact with God and is truly transformed and walks in to a room and says, oh, look, there you are. It's this outward movement. And I certainly did not have that at six days sober, my first contact with God. Um, I'm a taker. I'm a, I'm a selfish, self-centered taker. And I didn't even know that that was my problem. It took me many, many years to figure that out. So I, I showed up to AA casually. I was, um, I was just a meeting attender. I was not a member in any way. Um, didn't lift a finger to help. And uh, <laughs> I didn't work the steps, really, um, at least not out of the book. And I had a sponsor that told me I couldn't work step four until I was a year sober. So I'm just walking around with untreated alcoholism wanting to kill myself. And... Um, sought therapy, sought a lot of external things to try to fix this internal condition that was screaming and dying and um, uh, had a little a little light suicide attempt and um, I had to take a drink again. I, I, I was either going to kill myself or I was going to drink again and I'm so grateful I chose to drink again and that was on, um, that was in January of 2006, so I was 21 years old. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an agnostic at this point. I'm, I'm not diving into God, but I, uh, for some reason, decided to go on this uh, uh, retreat uh, to, uh, for school to study early Christian art in Italy and France and England. I don't know why I chose this, but I, I get on a plane, and, um, and, I'm, and I'm, nine, I'm 18 months undrunk in Alcoholics Anonymous, just visiting y'all, and um, I'm Southern all of a sudden. And um, uh, I get on the plane, and... Um, I'm sick, you know, and uh, someone says, you want to drink? And I'm like, yeah. And in my head, I'm thinking, maybe I should tell them that I don't drink alcohol. I'm like, no, it's fine. They'll figure it out. And then the flight attendants, you know, doing whatever. I don't need to, I don't need to look or watch, see what's happening. And, you know, drink comes my way. Should I, should I smell it first? I'm like, no. Boom. And, uh, oh, I can still remember just that burn going down my throat, hitting my gut, and the warmth spreading over my body. <sighs> I'd been holding it in a long time, and I said, I'll have another one of those, and I'll have, an, <clears throat> I'll have another, I'll have another, take some Ambien, some Clonopin, let's go, let's uh, get a, another one, another one, another one. I don't know what happened. I was told that um, I was cut off by the flight attendant, uh, so I stole a bottle of wine from the back of the plane, and I woke up in Rome, and um, <laughs> thus started my last debacle, uh, walking through some of the holiest places in Europe, out, completely out of my mind. And um, like, I went to Assisi. Like, I saw the place where Saint Francis was buried in the church that he built. And I'd been in AA just long enough to like know a little bit about the Saint Francis prayer, and I I, I remember out of it, but being like, this is pretty cool, <laughs> you know, and. Um, <laughs> 
So my last drink, and this is for me. This is this is not, this is the selfish part for me. This is for me. This is remembering right now. January sixteenth, two thousand and six was my last drink. It was my mom's birthday. I had no idea it was my mom's birthday. I was in Florence, Italy, and I really believed that this time will be different. I'm gonna have three glasses of wine. I've never drank three glasses of wine in Florence, Italy. I've never had a glass of wine out of a bottle because I've only drank it out of a box. So I can definitely handle myself differently. I'm 21 now. It's Florence, Italy. I'm totally gonna be fine. I have my three glasses of wine at this fancy Italian restaurant in Florence, Italy, and um, it's on. And it's like, you don't know how much you need to breathe until you put a paper bag over your head. I'm suffocating. And I'm like, where's the vodka? <laughs> and I convince a bartender is closing his bar to sell me half handle of um a vodka. I always go to vodka. And for like 60 euro, which is way too much. I was desperate though. And he worked me over as an American man. He knew. It's like this girl. And, um, and I'm in my, I'm in my hotel room and I'm taking shot after shot after shot. I'm like throwing up half of them. I was embarrassed of that fact. Like I literally had a reaction to alcohol, but I'm like forcing it. I need it. Forcing it down. And I am getting drunker and drunker and drunker, and I am not feeling any better. And that was the first time that really happened for me. And it was the most terrifying experience, and I hope I never forget that alcohol is not a solution in my life any longer. And I was carried to my room, because I'm classy, and um, <laughs> I woke up the next morning on January 17th, 2006. That is my day, that's my day. That's when God brought me back to you, because what he did is he filled my mind with um, your stories and your hope, and, um, and I wanted what you had just, just, from, just from being a visitor in, in, in those 18 months of showing up to AA, and um, stop taking all the, stop, put it all down. I got so sick. I, like, developed shingles at 21. My body, like, went into shock. It was crazy, but the next thing I remember, because it was kind of foggy. I think it's about January 20th, according to the itinerary, and I'm in Paris. So I'm like three days sober, and um, I come to, and I, I guess I came out of a taxi. I'm pretty sure I got out of a taxi. And um, I'm in front of this 900-year-old church on the Seine, and I can see the Eiffel Tower, and don't know how I got there, why I'm in front of this place, but I go into the church, because why not? And um, there's an AA meeting in the basement, and uh, it's an English-speaking meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a big book study, and they have just started chapter three, more about alcoholism. <laughs> because my God speaks to me in bright, flashing neon lights, like, you idiot, <laughs> you know? And I had the most powerful experience of recognizing that um, <sighs> there are people all over the world working out of this book, doing this program, um, exactly as outlined, and living incredible, useful, effective lives. Um, and maybe I'll have that. And this is like, this, this is pre-Zoom, like, you know, you knew new people, I don't know. I felt like, like, like I was some old timer, but like, like pre-Zoom, like I just, I, we, we didn't have this, at least I didn't, this, this image of our whole fellowship. Now we can, we can Zoom to Paris any day if you want to, but I just did not, I'd had no context of people from all over the world. And I'm in this meeting, there's like expats, there's someone from Germany, people from all over the U.S., and I had never felt so connected to the worldwide fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. It blew me away. You blew me away. And um, and so I came back to the U.S. and um, got a new sponsor, and we and we we worked in the program to the best of my ability. And and I would love to I would love to tell you that I've been a perfect example of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am a little AA muffin. I'm so great. I um, I put the plug in the jug, and I've just been skipping along, um, being just perfect. And um, I have not lived in the spirit of every single one of our traditions. That's a fun talk. Uh, let's talk later if you want to know about that. Every single one. And, um, and I have, and I have, um, I'm going to talk about how I made a mess of my life sober. So, um, uh, like I said, I, I, I came back, I, I got a great sponsor. I, I, I worked the steps. I did, I did the best, best I could at amends and an in inventory and, you know, went to my mom with the money I owed her. And, um, she, she was like so offended that, <laughs> like, that I'm trying to give her money. And she, I mean, like offended. She's like, I just want you to be okay. And I'm so pissed at that response because this is like my karmic retribution, you know, like give this. And my sponsor's like, maybe what you really owe your mom is peace of mind because that's what you actually stole from her. And um, I can't write a check for that. Um, 
it's, you know, I just wanted everything to be better now. And um, what I needed was day after day, year after year, a lot of work to make that right in the family. And um, it's taken a long, long time to make it right in the family. So, um, and I'll get to that in a second, but I, I did my best at the amends. I had some great stories. Um, I could get up to a podium and I could tell you some stories. I could make some people cry. And, and then I started to sound really good in AA. I can be a really good parrot. I can hear some things that you're saying and then I can spew them and um, look good in a meeting and then come back and want to kill myself at home or people don't want to be friends with me anymore. Let me share with you. And I'm seven years sober. I, I'd gotten married at AA. I, I made amends to that family that I nannied for in St. Croix. The, the, the kids stood up my wedding. Very, very nice things. So great. And, um, but I'm seven years sober and, um, I'm uninvited to some family vacations. Uh, my mom and I got into a physical altercation. I'm not a great example of, of a wife really. Um, I had a, <laughs> I had a coworker email me like, please never speak to me again. She worked next to me. We shared a space. So that was awkward. And, um, <laughs> like, I'm just, oh, I hated everyone in AA. Oh my gosh, everyone. You all have that home group member that you're like, oh, they would be better served in another home group. <laughs> a lot of those. Um, I had multiple sponsees, you know, leave my sponsorship. I'm like a vision for you, okay? And um, <laughs> it's great. And um, I'm thinking about how I can drive my car off of uh, the Folsom Bridge. Like how fast I need to go. I'm always gripping the free, the steering wheel on the freeways. I'm just, <clears throat> and, um, and then God intervened in my life once again. And, um, there was this woman that I really hated in AA. Um, she was so beautiful. It really pissed me off. Like she was so happy and like people would line up to give her a hug and it was like, ew. And, um, <laughs> I mean, she, and she worked the program different than me. And so that was definitely wrong because it's different, you know? And, um, and I, I honestly don't know why. And I called her and I said, would you sponsor me? And she was shocked. <laughs> and, um, she was, we laugh about it so much today. And, um, and this, but this woman is such a beautiful example of Alcoholics Anonymous. And all she wants to do is be of maximum service. And she said yes to this brat. And, um, we started going back through the book. And again, there, there's no right or wrong. Like, don't hear that. But like, she took me through the book in a different way. And she used language that was different for me. And because, um, again, not right or wrong, but I'm like crazy and I'm a words person. And so like, I had always done fourth, fourth steps with like, you know, the resentment and like the cause and then how it affects me and then my part. And like, that's great because when there's parts, like here's your part and here's mine. My part is very small and you have the rest of the pie. And I'm just still really pissed like all the time. And I'm so, and I'm like, I'm so angry. I don't even realize how much I hate people at seven years sober. And so she's like, well, the book talks about like, where did I set the ball rolling? Like, where am I at fault? And um, again, I'm crazy. And that language just, it was different is different. And, um, so I'll give you an example. So there's this gentleman in my home group really would have been better. In another home group, hate him, um, gossip about him all the time. Um, all the time. And, um, we, we would see each other every week and I wouldn't look him in the eye. And, um, that was great. That's better than like yelling at his face or saying whatever else I want to do. And my sponsor was like, wow. Yeah. Um, I mean, freedom for me is being able to walk into any room and look people in the eye. And I'm like, Duh. um, I didn't even consider that that's even what I would want. And, um, so I'd been praying for this man for a long time. Um, but you know, like the sick man prayer in the book where it's like, oh dear God. Um, oh, look at this sick man. He's so sick. Oh, poor sick man. Like that's how I prayed for him. You know, like he's. <laughs> He's very sick. And, um, you know, so I've been doing that for a long time. And my sponsor's like, yeah, that's cool, cool. Um, but why don't you pray for him, like, maybe sincerely? And that became easy to do when I actually did a fourth column where I looked at where I was at fault, where I set the ball rolling. And one of the things that I noted, besides all of my poor behavior, is that he was a perfect, ex perfect mirror of myself. And that part in the 12 and 12 that talks about that anytime I'm disturbed no matter what the cause, it is me. And, um, yeah, so it became really easy to pray for him because I saw me and him and how can I hate someone that is me, you know? And, um, so I started praying for him sincerely and my sponsor at this point had had me start praying on my knees. Um, she invited me to do so. And, um, I still had a lot, man, I was still so prejudiced 
at seven years sober, again, spiritual terms and spiritual activities, but I was so desperate not to die that um, I started praying on my knees. And um, I've done very few things perfectly, but I've prayed on my knees morning and night ever since then, and that's been about a decade now. And, um, and I started praying on my knees for this person specifically and sincerely for everything that I would want, um, for, the, for his health, for his, um, for his children, for his family, for his, for his job, you know, everything. And um, I prayed on my knees morning and night for five days. Um, and then I walked into my, into my meeting on Friday night, and... I remember we hadn't spoken to each other or looked each other in the eye in a year and a half. And um, he walked straight up to me and he said, Katie, can we go speak outside? And I said, okay. And we went outside and with tears in his eyes flowing down his cheeks, he said, last night I had a dream about you. And in my dream, I was making amends to you. And uh, my creator stood right in between us. And, um, and I got to make amends to him and um, I'm free. I'm so free. I can see him, and I can look him in the eye, and I can give him a hug, and I can ask him about his kids, and um, we're good, you know? And then I'd love to tell you that the rest of the amends that I made during that time period of my life went just as beautifully, and they did not. And um, as most people really told me what uh, how I had been affecting them. Because seven years sober, I'm dense, and I still don't realize how much I affect other people. And when I went to my stepmom, because I was ready to no longer have a relationship with my dad. I was seven years sober trying to figure out the right word, like the script, to like tell my dad I never wanted to talk to him again. And um, through a really great inventory process, really <laughs> realized that was probably not the right thing to do. And I actually had a lot of amends to make to his wife and um, did that, and she let me have it. She did, and it was fair. It was, it was, it was fair. And, uh, but I got to walk away free, even though it was painful. I walked away free and I got to actually change my behavior. I don't know what, I don't, I wish I knew why I have to be humiliated into humility. I'll ask God one day. Um, but that's generally the only way it's ever worked for me. Um, because I don't have the power to do any of this on my own. Do, we know this. I, I, I do not have the power to not take a drink today. This power does not originate in me. God has given me a gift that out, the 10 step promises, we always read the nine step promises. They're cool, but the 10 step promises, let's go. The problem has been removed. That's, that is, that is mirac the, the fact that I don't want to take a drink today is miraculous. Now God has the ability to do all of those things in my life. He just takes a lot, a lot slower to remove these defects of character for me. My goodness. I like, wish we could hurry up, but it just hasn't happened. What I've had to do is humiliate myself in very public ways, um, in Alcoholics Anonymous in order to, to gain some measure of humility. And I got to do that and I get to have a whole new experience with my family. You know, like I, like I said earlier, um, it took, it's taken me a long time to clean up the wreckage. I, I had so many girls come to me and they want everything fixed right at once. They want all, the, all of this fixed. And like we took, it took years to burn it down. It takes years to build it back up. And I'm, I'm not joking you. I'm 17 years sober. I think my dad finally recognized my sobriety date when I was like 13, 14, um, noted it. And it was just, I was pregnant, what, two years ago. And my dad held my hand. We were on vacation together. And he said, I'm so proud of you. <clears throat> that's what you all showed me. You know, you all showed me how to have the innocence back with my dad and to be able to show up and um, be disciplined and not a complete jerk every time. You know, I, I feel like I could, we, we need to have more books about how to transition and to be an adult child because I was walking around just being a kid and acting so immature. And I'm so grateful for this process that we have, these 12 steps to really take a look at my behavior. Um, and AA has helped me grow up. The traditions have helped me grow up. Let me tell you, that's, I love the traditions. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just lightly say I've been, I've been married to my husband for, um, 12 years now, and it is a hundred percent a result of the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, in, in our life and how I get to practice our common welfare. That's not just about me. Any decision that I'm going to make is going to affect my group and I have to consider him and I have the ability to act autonomously anytime I want, except when it affects my group. And I have to maybe think about that. Is God a part of our group conscience? I don't know. Do I bring him into it? And am I self-supporting? Am I self-supporting in my marriage? Do I have all my dependency on him and him bringing my fulfillment and my happiness? Can I stand alone? 
and I get to stand alone in Alcoholics Anonymous. He's not a member here, and I get to I get to do this, and he gets to support me, and we get to live kind of different paths in that way. But I'm I'm so grateful that I got to. Do you know what else? Another good one: anonymity. Do I? Can I just do the dishes, or do I demand a sticker and a gold star for doing so? You know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, so. Uh, through this process of the steps and going through it over and over and over and over again, I've I've gotten to build better relationships in my life. The 12 and 12 talks a lot about relationships and how we've never really actually been able to have a true partnership with anyone. And today I get to be a friend among friends, a worker among workers, and I absolutely couldn't have done that without you all. I've had the same, I've been married for 12 years, had the same job for 12 years. Again, the traditions and the principles of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has enabled me to maintain those things. Again, not perfect. I get to make mistakes all the time, but it's amazing how that works. And, you know, the the last couple of years have been miraculous, um, hard and beautiful. Uh, My husband had this really horrible traumatic brain injury and, um, I was told that he was never going to be the same, that I was always going to ha- be his constant advocate. He was never going to work again, constant headaches. I mean, it was a laundry list of what was going to happen. And AA showed up, man. <laughs> Y'all brought me food and had meetings in the in the waiting room and because um, he was in the ICU for like a month. And um, um, he's, it was, he had a complete complete healing. It's just um, the people who prayed for him. I mean, there are thousands of people. He was completely healed. But what happened is, um, you know, my first night in the hospital, I had a friend in the fellowship who showed up and she brought me some water and she brought me socks. And she, um, she told me, she said, you probably don't know this, but ICUs are really cold and your feet are going to be cold. And she gave me some socks. You know, I didn't know. And um, a couple years ago, I had a, a close friend in the program drown, had a traumatic brain injury, and he was in the hospital. He he did pass, but well, his, I, I got to show up for his girlfriend, and I got to bring her socks. Because I had the knowledge that she didn't, which is that your feet are going to be really cold. And I feel like that's the gifts that we get to give each other. We get to share our experience and, and get to help each other out with, with some warm feet. <laughs> and... Um, and, uh, and, and eight years ago, my husband and I were told that we were never going to have, be able to have a child and, um, did a lot of things to try to make that happen. And I went through, um, so much grief, um, so much pain. And I have one of those sponsors where I'm calling her and I'm, um, on the ground. Um, and she says, call, you know, pray and call me back, take a shower, call me back, put on a dress, call me back, do your hair, call me back, get a sponsor to drive you a meeting, call me back, um. I'll see you there. Um, she walked me through um, so much pain, and I got to um, I got to just show up in AA despite how I felt. Thank God it's not about my feelings. Um, thank God I just get to be shown how to take action I don't believe in um, until I start to feel different. And um, uh, but I have a baby. <laughs> she she came. Twenty twenty was like the best year of my life, and. Um, uh, <laughs> And I have this daughter, and she is um, she is AA's baby. And um, when I was pregnant, um, I was joking like her lullaby is going to be rarely have we seen a person fail. Um, <laughs> she she is she is God's kid, and I just get to hold on to her for a little bit. And um, I am I am so I, I can't even tell you the life I get to live as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm so forever grateful. And I think I got just a couple minutes. I'm going to hit my time, Jason. Um, so I'm a, I'm a, I love service in Alcoholics Anonymous. I love service. We've been, ta- we got general service people here. Oh my gosh. I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a just, yes, I'll do it type of person. If there's an opportunity to be of service, whatever, I don't even know what it is. I'll do it. I like raised my hand for this thing. I didn't even know what it was a couple years ago. It's called an appointed committee member. And I got to serve on the trustees literature committee in New York. Unbelievable experience. You don't have to be anybody in a, I'm no, I'm not anybody special. I promise you. I've like nothing special here, but I said, I do it. And they said, okay, let's go. And I got to like go to New York and I got to work on all these really cool young people's projects and the fifth edition big book and like unbelievable experience getting connected to the worldwide program of alcoholics. Now I'm going to my pitch for general service. If you don't know about it, come talk to me, go be a GSR. It's the best. But I also do crazy things like raise my hand when my grand sponsor goes, does anyone want to go to Africa? And I'm like, yeah, cool. Sounds great. And um, why not? I have a sobriety sister who sponsors the first woman sober in Uganda. And um, and I had met her and I want to go see Agnes. So like, let's go. And um, by the way, there's like, uh, Kampala, Uganda has the most alcoholism per capita in the world. It's a city of 16 million people and there are 60 people in their fellowship. 
Um, and there's three meetings a week and they're at noon. So like you better find a way to get there if you want to get sober. So it's always funny. Someone's like, I can't make it to a meeting. There's like a thousand meetings in my area every week. I'm like, okay. Anyways. Okay. That's not the point of the story. So, um, this is, this is my allegory for Alcoholics Anonymous. Are you ready? So my grand sponsor, her husband, another sober member and his, his dad, we all decided to go look for trek wild mountain gorillas in the Buindi impenetrable forest in Uganda. Super cool. Why not? And, um, there's 800 of them left in the world. Might as well see it before they're gone. And, um, no one's prepared for what we have to do. I don't know if they thought we were going to a zoo. Um, but like <laughs> we're in the impenetrable forest. Like we had machetes and the guys with AKs and not like for us in case we're attacked and, you know, get it, get it over with fast. And, um, we, we go on this trek and like, they're not prepared. So what should have been four hours turned into 14. And, um, we, we got to see that these gorillas, it was, a, I mean, silverback gorilla, the, hit the mom nursing a baby gorilla, like out of control. I was sobbing. It was so incredible. And I got to be totally sober for it. Right. And, but here's the part of the story. We're making our way back. We're not like, we're literally out of food and water. I've been on my feet going 12 miles up and down 2000 feet of elevation like this with machetes. I mean, it's like, I, I'm like, kept going, how did I get here? Like, how is, how, I don't understand, right? Kind of like today, I'm watching seals. I'm getting splashed by seals. It was wild. Anyways, um, I don't know how I'm there. I'm so thirsty. I'm so tired. I'm so scared. The lights are out at this point. We're walking at eight o'clock at night. We've all gotten separated. I'm with my, my grand sponsor's husband. He's like 75. And I'm, I'm pushing him as he's struggling to breathe. Again, I've given him all my water. All I have is the flashlight from my phone. It's pitch dark. And I'm telling you, I'm working through inventory because I'm so scared and so mad. And it's not helping. And, um, <laughs> And we stop at one point and, um, we stop and cause so Kent can take, catch his breath. And, um, you can hear these wild African elephants crashing down trees all around us. There are black mambas. There are wild gorillas. Who knows what else, you know? And I, bugs like you would not believe. And I'm like, Kent, so I'm like pretty scared and I'm pretty upset right now. Like, what should we do? And he goes, let's bring God in. Not my first response. And, um, <laughs> But he puts his hand on my shoulder and, um, and he starts praying and I look up and I missed it. I had missed this incredible sky and it was full of more stars than I had ever seen. I'm like literally in the middle of Uganda, which is in the middle of continent Africa. <laughs> and it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And I would have missed it. So I was looking at my feet <laughs> and, um, and I was a little lighter, you know, and, um, we start, we, we kept walking out and, and we got out and, uh, we got out, of course I'm here. Um, <laughs> but here's the allegory, right? Is that, um, I want to see the giant beam to know how the, where the end of the trail is to know how the story is going to end. Um, I want to see the end, but all I have is the light for my next step. And that tends to be sufficient, you know, one little step at a time. Right. But with my hand on an old timer and the old timer, who's closer to God than me, that leads me the way, right? And, um, and that's been my journey in Alcoholics Anonymous. One hand in an old timer showing me what to do, bringing me close to God, taking one little step at a time, trusting that the end of the road is going to be pretty dang good, and it surely has been. This is going to be an amazing weekend, and I'm super grateful to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.